Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic we're going to look at approximating solutions to boundary value problems using the shooting method. So in this topic we're going to look and define boundary value problems. We will then see how we can find approximations to solutions using an initial value problem solver. We will first do so for cases where the underlying ODE is linear, and then we will carry on and consider approximating solutions for the case when they are nonlinear. In the second case, we will use an iterative secant method. Now, by the end of this lab, you will understand boundary value problems, how to use an initial value problem solver in order to approximate solutions to a boundary value problem. We will see how we can find or approximate solutions to boundary value problems where the underlying ODE is linear, and we will see how we can use a secant method in order to find solutions when the underlying ODE is nonlinear. Now, in all of these cases, we are going to assume that you have already written the function dp45, which we did in a previous lab. This initial value problem solver uses Dorman Prince method. If you do not have this function, you're welcome to use the built-in function ODE45. The only issue is that you will have to transpose the output. Now, any second order boundary value problem begins with a second order ODE in the general form. We're going to have, there are going to be two constraints. On an interval, we will constrain the value of the solution to be some fixed value at the left hand endpoint and another different fixed value at the other endpoint. Now, in general, rather than looking at the general second order ODE, we will simply look at those second order ODEs where we can write it in the form the second derivative is a function of x, u of x, and its derivative. The implicit function theorem says that this is, in general, possible. So this is not a significant constraint. Now, if we start with an ODE, or a boundary value problem, let's consider a corresponding initial value problem for that second order ODE, where we have two constraints just at the left hand endpoint A. An initial value problem, of course, fixes the initial value, and also the initial slope. We're going to specify both of these values at the left-hand endpoint of the bound of the interval on which we are finding the boundary value problem or solution. So thus, here's an interval from two to three. We have a number of solutions that originate at this point, each with an, a different initial slope. Our goal will be to find that solution such that if we follow that solution out with that initial slope, it passes through our second boundary value at x equals b. We're going to see that we can do this in two different ways. First, we're going to see a simple technique we can use when the ODE is linear, and then when the ODE is nonlinear. The second technique is, of course, a little bit more difficult. We're going to start with the linear ODE. A second order ODE is linear if you can write it in the following form. Second derivative plus a function of x times the first derivative plus a function of x times, the func but times u of x equaling a forcing function. Now, because we will be using an initial value problem solver, we will write it in the form the second derivative is the forcing function minus the balance of the equation. Or. Now, as well as a general linear ODE, we will also consider its corresponding homogeneous ODE. This is where the forcing function is set to zero, and so in this case, the second derivative is just equated to, to the balance of the left-hand side shifted to the other side. Now, in order to demonstrate these techniques, we're going to use a specific 
uh, second order linear ODE, where the coefficient of the derivative is sine of x and the forcing function is 1. Our two constraints will, of course, be at x equals 2, where we constrain the value of the function to be 1.5, and at x equals 3, where we constrain the value of the function to be 2.5. Of course, anywhere on the interval in between, the solution must satisfy the second order ODE. Now, the corresponding linear, uh, homogeneous linear ODE is, of course, this where the forcing function 1 is set to 0. Now, let's say that u sub g is a solution to the general linear ODE, and u naught is a solution to the corresponding homogeneous linear ODE. Then, any multiple of the homogeneous solution added to the general solution is also a solution to the general linear ODE. Let's see that this is true. If I take this general, or this sum, and stick it into the derivative, notice I have the second derivative of the sum plus q of x times the derivative of the sum plus r of x times the sum. We can distribute the, or the differentiation across the addition, take out the coefficients, and now let's take the corresponding solutions to the general ODE and group them, and at the same time grouping the homogeneous solutions. Now, we assumed that u sub g was a solution to the general linear ODE, and so what does this equal? Well, that must equal g of x. Similarly, this being a solution to the homogeneous uh, problem, that has to equal zero. So we can see that this sum, when substituted into the left-hand side of the general linear ODE, equals the forcing function. And so therefore this too is a solution to the general linear ODE. All right. So now let's take our boundary value problem and instead re redefine it as an initial value problem. We're going to, of course, have the constraint that at the left-hand endpoint, the value must be the left-hand boundary value. At the same time, let's suppose that the slope of the function at that point is zero. We don't need zero, but let's pick zero anyway for convenience. Similarly, we are going to define an initial value problem for the corresponding homogeneous second-order linear ODE. And here, we're going to say that the initial value at the left-hand endpoint must be 0, and the initial slope at that point must be 1. So now we have two separate solutions, one to the general case, I'll call it u sub g, and one to the homogeneous case, I'll call that u sub naught. So, taking a look at our previous example, we would redefine our boundary value as problem as an initial value problem where here the slope is zero, and with the corresponding homogeneous case, where the initial value here is zero and the initial slope is one. So let's plot these two. We have two different solutions but we can add a multiple of the homogeneous solution onto the linear ODE and still get a solution to the general linear ODE. Here we have the general solution with initial slope equal to zero. Here we have a solution to the homogeneous with initial slope equal to one. Having found these two, we can now take any scalar multiple of the homogeneous solution and add it on to the general solution, uh, to the uh, corresponding one with the forcing function g of x. Now we want to ensure that whatever coefficient we pick c, that the resulting product passes through the second boundary value. So for example, here I have the solution with the general forcing function, and then plus or minus the homogeneous solution. Neither of those pass through the second boundary value, but if we take a look, notice that 
if we add approximately twice the homogeneous solution, then it does appear to pass, it should pass quite closely to that second boundary value. So let's actually find the coefficient c that we require. It's probably not going to be 2, but it should be close. Well, how do we solve that for that? Well, actually, it's simply just algebra. Here we have our sum of the two. Now, we notice that if we substitute a into that, we get the left-hand value because, of course, those were our initial conditions. But we want that if we evaluate this sum at the point x equals b, we want the value u sub b, the right-hand boundary value. Well, that's easy enough. That's just simple algebra. We solve for c, and we're done. Now, wait a second. We're trying to find the actual solution, and we're using two initial problem solvers. One to solve the general case with the forcing function g of x, and then one with the corresponding homogeneous solution. But DP45 is an adaptive method, and so the x values, the intervals, will not always be equally spaced. So how can we add the two solutions together if the x values aren't equally spaced? Well, recall in the previous lab, we could take a system of ODEs and solve them simultaneously. In that case, all of the x values would be equivalent. Therefore, we're going to define a system of two second-order linear ODEs, and we will solve them simultaneously. However, in this case, unlike most of the cases we looked at previously, these two are uncoupled. There's no relationship between them. Uh, you t uh, the second one doesn't appear here. The solution to the first doesn't appear in the second. The solution to the second doesn't appear in the first. So using our techniques in lab, in the previous lab, we are going to write a system of four first order linear or first order ODEs. In the first case, W1 gives you the solution. W2 is its derivative to the general case. To the homogeneous, W3 is the solution to the homogeneous, and W4 is its derivatives. So now we can solve for W1, 2, 3, and 4, and that will give us the solutions to the general and the homogeneous cases. And that's what we're looking for. We're also going to have our initial conditions. The first two initial conditions will be the value at the left-hand endpoint and a slope of 0. The second initial condition will be a value of 0 and a slope of 1. So for example, consider our boundary value problem we were looking at before. We're going to redefine this as a function in MATLAB according to our previous lab. When we pass this into DP45, we will get an output with four rows, each row being a solution to the corresponding function, W1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, uh, 1, 2, through 4. And of course, these are our initial values or initial conditions. Easy enough, we can do this with dp45 already having defined the function. Now we can solve for our coefficient just by taking our right hand boundary value. And remember, the first row was the solution to the general case where we have a non zero forcing function. And of course, at the right hand endpoint, at x equals b, that is the last entry in that first row. Similarly, the third row of that output matrix are the solutions to the second, or to the homogeneous linear ODE. 
and the last value is its value at x equals b. Because again, we're defining this on the interval from a to b. So now we get our coefficient, 1.99162 and change. Well, that's pretty close to what we estimated it should be. We estimated that it should be approximately equal to 2. We can now take the first row and add on to that first row the multiple times the third row. So the points approximating the solution to the general second order ODE and the solutions to the homo um, the points approximating the solution to the homogeneous initial value problem. Let's plot those and notice that yes, it does appear to go through 2.5 as we would expect. We can even evaluate our solution at both the endpoints and yes, both of our boundary values are satisfied. We can check our solution in Maple. In fact, this is the solution to our boundary value problem. This is the exact solution. And we can plot that exact solution in Maple. It does take a while, but again, that's a rather complex expression to evaluate. If we compare that with the solution that MATLAB found, or that we found with our approximating tools, then yes, it does appear to be pretty close. As a second example, let's just take this linear ODE with two boundary values. And now we would have a different function that we would load into MATLAB that would describe the right-hand side of our system of first-order ODEs. We can do the same thing here. We can approximate the solutions having taken the second and third, first and third solutions. We can calculate the coefficient, add the first row onto the coefficient times the third row, and that will give us our solution, and we can plot it. Now in this case, we start at 1.5, we dip way down to approximately, say, negative 18, and go back up to 2.5. In this case, I'm also showing the points to demonstrate that, yes, we are using an adaptive iterative method. Well, we can also find an answer in Maple. It's also approximately as complex as the previous one, but this is, in fact, the exact solution. If we plot the solution, we appro the approximation in MATLAB and the exact solution in Maple, we see that, yes, they are, in fact, pretty close to each other. If we repeat all of these examples again with the same boundary values, but instead of choosing x equals um, the interval zero, 2 to 3, let's choose the interval 2 to 4. So we'll move that second boundary value over 1. Again, we can see that we do find a solution, and it's pretty close to the solution found by Maple. Again, where the function changes rapidly, the, iter the adaptive method, DP45, uses a smaller step. Where the function is, where the solution is more s straight, we use a wider or larger step. So both of these examples were for linear ODEs. What happens if we have an ODE which is not linear? In this case, we have a problem. There's no guarantee we can find a solution using this simple technique because there is no corresponding homogeneous problem that we can just add a scalar multiple of to the original. So instead we're going to have to go back to the more general case. We're going to have our second derivative is some nonlinear expression in x, u of x, and its derivative. Now let u sub s be the solution to the initial value problem where we have our left-hand constraint from the boundary value problem and where we have an unknown slope s or an arbitrary slope s. So this defines a class of, u sub s defines a class of solutions. We want to find that specific slope that will allow us 
to pass through the second boundary value when we follow that solution. Well, to do this, we're going to define a new function, an error function. And the error function is a function of s. Given a slope, find the solution with that initial slope, evaluate that solution at the right-hand endpoint, and subtract from that the boundary value at that right-hand endpoint x equals b. This is an error. This is the error of the approximation starting with the slope s. Well, now we have something that we can zero. Basically, now, if we find a root of this expression, then we have found the slope s, which, if we start off at that slope, at that slope then after following the interval, we will get the right-hand value at x equals b. So we have a root-finding problem. Now, what is the error function? Well, the error function is a little bit more complex. It's not just a simple expression. We have to take an argument s, and by the way, you shouldn't name a function something as short as error in MATLAB, since that may be a variable that someone might readily use. So I will call this error sub shot. Starting with this initial slope s, where does it end up? What is the error of our shot? How far is it off from our right-hand boundary value? So we call dp45, find the solution, evaluate that solution at the right-hand endpoint, and subtract off of it the boundary value at that value, at that endpoint. This gives us our delta ub, or our error. All right, so now all we have to do is find this zero. Now, uh, just one comment. We will want to use this for numerous different initial value problems, and so rather than just passing s, we should also pass in the other parameters that will be required by dp45 in order to find this solution. So again, here are our boundary values. The first boundary value will be used in our initial value problem. The second boundary value will be used to find the error of the solution evaluated at the second endpoint. Now, let's say we have this error function, and without proof, I will state that it is going to be continuous, assuming a solution exists, at least in the range of the solution. And suppose we have two approximations of the root. Here are two slopes that are reasonably close to the actual slope, which is a solution. What does the secant method say? Well, if I have those two slopes and the function is continuous and differentiable, if I want to find the zero of the function error of s, I can find an interpolating, I have my two initial approximations, s1 and s2, and then I can find a better approximation by putting an interpolating line through those points and finding the root of that interpolating line. From your previous classes, you do know that there is a formula for the secant method, and so we can just evaluate the function at the appropriate points, take the appropriate linear combination, and now we find S3, the next point, the better approximation of our root or a better approximation of the initial slope we want to use that actually goes through the right-hand endpoint. Essentially, what the secant method says is, what, if we start off with these two initial approximations, what is the root of the function if the function error of s was linear? Because error of s is not linear, Otherwise, we'd have a linear ODE. Uh, therefore, 
this is only, S3 is only an approximation of the root, and therefore we may want to go on. Having t these two approximations of the root, we may apply the secant method through those two points and find a fourth approximation of the root, which should again be even better. We're going to continue iterating and iterating until what? Well, wait a second. You must recall that any numerical method which uses an iterative technique will have or is has certain issues. First of all, we have to know how when we're going to halt. But also, there may be the possibility of failure. There may not be a solution. In which case, we have to know when to stop. We can't iterate forever. We're going to take both of these into consideration when we decide what to do with when we describe the secant method to find this solution. So for the secant method, we're going to start off with two approximations, S1 and S2. We'll call them that. Let's assume that the error at S1 is, less, is greater than the error at S2. Otherwise, we'll just swap them. So basically, S2 is more accurate or closer to the root than S1. We're going to iterate the secant method at most n submax times. If we go beyond this, then we will indicate an error. But with each iteration, we will take S1 and S2, find the interpolating polynomial, find the root of that, and that will be our next approximation. That will be our next approximation, S. Now the question is, is that a good enough approximation? Well, first of all, we'll have to make sure that the distance between S2 and our new value S are in fact close enough. Basically, we don't want a large jump and then immediately halt. We'd like our iterative technique to appear to at least converge. Also, we will require that the error function at that point s is sufficiently small. After all, we are looking for a root. Now, that gives us our initial slope. Oh, sorry, that will give us our slope that we will use in our initial value problem. Of course, for the shooting method, we don't want that slope. What we want is the solution that begins with that slope. So we're going to, later on, take care of that. But let's suppose we haven't found the slope yet. One of our two or both of our constraints have not yet been satisfied. Then we'll just set S1 to be the value of S2. And S2 will be set to the point that we found. So essentially, we start with S1 and S2. Now we're going to start, and we're going to use these two points as our values, S1 and S2. We'll continue iterating until we find, well, either we go some maximum number of times, or both of our constraints are satisfied. If we do iterate a maximum number of times, we'll throw an exception with an appropriate message. Now, again, as I said, the secant method normally just returns the slope. Your function shooting, however, will have to return the solution that begins with that slope. So basically, once we find S, then we will simply once again evaluate DP45 with our conditions, and that will be the output of the shooting method. So here's the shooting method. It has outputs of the solution, uh, the points at which we are approximating the solutions, and the value of our approximations. The arguments are our two initial values. The function handle for the right-hand side of the differential equation, the second derivative is equated to a function of x, u of x, and its derivative. x range is a set of two points, or a vector of two points, specifying the interval a and point a, interval endpoints a and b. U sub boundary is also a row vector of two values specifying the two boundary conditions. H is our initial step size to be used when we're calling dp45. Epsilon sub abs is going to be the argument that's passed on to dp45, we can't expect an error greater than that in, the, uh, in u. And we're also going to pass that on to the secant method. 
epsilon step will be passed onto the secant method and that will just ensure that our iterative iteration actually does appear to converge. Finally, n sub max is the maximum number of times that the secant method will be allowed to run, otherwise will indicate failure. Now, what do we use as our initial values S1 and S2? We don't know what they are. Well, as an engineer, if you're actually applying the shoot shooting method, you probably know anyway what your solution should be. You should have a good understanding of your problem. Therefore, you will know two reasonable starting points that do both approximate the initial slope S you want to use. In the labs, therefore, we're simply going to give you the initial slopes. In reality, you will understand the slopes that you should be using. So let's look at an example. Here we have a nonlinear ODE. This is nonlinear because we have this derivative and times the function u of x, and here we have the function u of x squared. Both of these make the expression nonlinear. Here's our boundary values. We're using the same boundary values as the previous problem. Now we have to convert the second order ODE into a system of two first order ODEs. And so again, we did that in the last lab. Here we see the right hand side. W1 sub approximates u of x, w2 approximates its derivative. Now, when I personally run my version of the shooting method, I get a solution where I start with negative 3 and negative 3.1, and I get convergence after only four steps. After one step, I get negative 3.32 and change. I get a few more digits of precision, but again, notice that my epsilon step size is 10 to the negative 6. So these two still differ by 10 to the negative 6. These two also still differ by more than 10 to the negative 6. But with the fourth iteration, the difference between these two is less than 10 to the negative 6, so at least one of the halting conditions has been satisfied. In fact, at the second point, the second halting condition has long since been satisfied. So if we now take this last slope, they are sufficiently close, and looking at the output of the solution with that last slope, we get a value at the right-hand endpoint of 2.4999. That's pretty close to 2.5. So let's plot it. Here's my plot with 36 points approximating on the interval from 2 to 3. There is my approximation of the solution. Now you may get slightly different values in the slope based on your implementation of the secant method, but you should get approximately the same appearance as what you see here. Now, let's take a look at the solution step by step. Well, taking a look here, notice that this is a solution with initial slope 3. This is a negative 3 with initial slope negative 3.1. Again, not very good. But even with our first, all other approximations are pretty close to each other. So even after the first application of the secant method, it's pretty close to the actual solution. In fact, we can take a look at the absolute error at the right-hand endpoint. 10 to the negative 1, 10 to the negative 1, 10 to the negative 3, 10 to the negative 5. So it is converging very quickly. Remember that epsilon sub abs was only 10 to the negative 6. So this had converged already at this point. We only required to iterate one more time because we had to also satisfy the second boundary, uh, the second constraint that the iteration appeared to converge. Now, one observation is that the secant method does not converge according to order h squared like Newton's method. It converges more slowly of the form h to the phi, where phi is the golden ratio approximately 
1 plus root 5 all over 2. You will notice if you calculate, this is approximately twice this value raised to the golden ratio. This is approximately twice this value raised to the golden ratio. So we actually do see the expected convergence we would get from the secant method. Now, you're going to be implementing these, the, this function, the shooting method, and error subshot. You're going to be working with values of s and the error subshot function quite often. Rather than continuously evaluating the error shot function at these values when we're calculating, for example, the, um, um, the next step in the secant method, it would be much more intelligent just to calculate it once and store it and then reuse it rather than continuously recalculating and re-evaluating the error subshot function at, our at the various slopes. Then, as you're iterating, you can update, calculate, and update these values as appropriate. So when you're updating S1 and S2, update the error values as well. So in this lab, we have looked at how we can use an initial value problem solver, in this case DP45, to approximate a solution to a boundary value problem using the shooting method. We convert the boundary value problem into an initial value problem, and we determine which angle we should start at so that our solution actually strikes the boundary value at x equals b. For linear ODE, uh, for where the underlying ODE was linear, all we had to do was calculate two solutions and we added a multiple of the solution to the homogeneous initial value problem to the general one with the forcing function g of x. If we're dealing with nonlinear cases, we're still using dp4 or 5, but we're going to use the secant method and iterate until we get a sufficiently good approximation. These are the references. Good luck with your lab and have a good day.